Good morning, everyone. So our current speaker, Gernot Heiser, will be presenting SCL4 is free. What does this mean for you? Good morning. Um, great to see you here. Uh, good to see a few familiar faces, and I must say I'm very happy to be here uh, for more reason than one. So, SEL4 is free. What does this mean? Well, what is SEL4? Not everyone may be familiar with this. It's um, a microkernel, which is the latest and greatest member of the L4 microkernel family, which has been around for 20 years. So it's based on 20 years of experience with building microkernels. Um, some of them are in fair amount of use. Uh, probably a, somewhere between a quarter and a half of you will have a phone that runs a, has a Qualcomm modem chip, in which case um, one of our earlier operating L4 kernels will be on there. How many of you have an iPhone, iPad, iPod, whatever? None? <laughs> yeah, okay. So you have it as well because um, the security coprocessor of the iOS devices now runs a version of the L4 microkernel one that came out of my lab about 10 years ago. Um, so there's a few billion of the predecessor systems deployed, um, which basically means we have a bit of experience of building kernels for real world use. Um, so this is L4 in general, and so SEL4 is part of that tradition, but with a few interesting extra bits. So in particular, what SEL4 is, it's the world's only operating system kernel which has, which with some degree of credibility, can claim to be secure. And that's um, a pretty strong statement, but it's actually backed up by pretty strong evidence. Uh, the actually the evidence of mathematical proof. That's the the only real. Um, way to guarantee anything about any code. All this um, standard software processes, code inspection, etc., peer review, thousand eyes, and all that nonsense is really just self delusion compared to actually proving things correct. And of course, the really cool thing is it's been open sourced half a year ago, and that's of course the only reason I'm here, and which is why I'm glad to be here. <laughs> So, so what, 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 what does this uh, proof stuff actually mean? So, we have a bunch of C code, a pile of C code, about 9,000 lines, so it's a very small system. Um, and as, for, as any real operating system kernel, it's written in C mostly, very, very little, just a few essential bits of assembler. And it's really, this is the stuff we care about, right? And where we want to have um, certain properties, uh, co convince ourselves that it has the right properties. And what the proofs mean is, we have an abstract. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so we have an abstract model of the kernel, and that's a it's a mathematical artifact. It's a, a um, description in a mathematical logic of the functionality of the kernel. So this completely describes the allowed kernel behavior. It basically says, under any any combination of inputs, how will the kernel react? And in that sense, gives a complete description of the kernel's functionality. And what we have is a so-called refinement proof of the, that the implementation, the C code, correctly implements the specification. What it strictly means is that any behavior possible under the semantics of C for this code is captured by this abstract model. And in that sense, the, co the implementation is correct against this abstract specification, so bug-free, etc. Implications, there's many of them, but just sort of the, um, a few obvious ones. It's not possible for this kernel to have a buffer overflow. It cannot, uh, it's provably 
does not use uninitialized variable def reference null pointers. There's no stack smashing. You can't have code injection. There's no return oriented programming. Any of that stuff is just not possible provably. So that's nice. But of course, what really runs on the machine is not the C code, it's the object code, the translated C binary that's gone through the, the C compiler and the linger and loader and all that stuff. So what we really would want is guarantees about the binary because as long as we have properties shown about the source code, then okay, that's fine. That's more than anyone else has. But of course, we still trust the C compiler not to stuff up. And we also um, implicitly trust that we use the same assumption about the C semantics as the compiler. And C, of course, the C semantics is ambiguous. It does not have a well-defined semantics, so we had to define a subset that is well-defined. And we can't guarantee that the compiler makes the same assumption. Um, so in order to eliminate that risk, we have also a proof that the object code is a correct translation of the C source. And that eliminates the compiler from the trusted computing base, so we can use any um, odd compiler. We generally use GCC. We should probably be using LLVM by now. Um, but it doesn't matter, we can use any, any compiler that's available. If the compiler has a bug, it will show up there. But, or if there's a mismatch in semantics, it will show up there because that proof won't work out. And so what the, that, that gives us overall is we now have a proof that all these properties, everything that's implied by functional correctness, hold for the binary. So that, that is a really strong statement, and it's the first time any of this has been done. The first the functional correctness proof, by the way, was done, finished on July 29th, 2009, so the open sourcing happened on the fifth anniversary of that day. So that's all fine. We know that we have a model that's correctly implemented and we therefore know exactly how this kernel operates, it doesn't guarantee that it does anything useful. Um, so in particular, that by itself does not allow us to make any claims that the system is secure or safe or anything like that. We need more than that. So what we have on top is the classical CIA security properties, confidentiality, integrity, availability. And what we really want is to be convinced that our kernel can enforce these properties. And that's in fact the case. We have further proof that our abstract model allows us to enforce these security properties. And because of the proof chain below it, we know that's actually done by the binary. So the binary of this kernel, as it runs on hardware, at least on ARM hardware, will enforce confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And that's the sense in which I claim that this is the world's most and probably the only actually secure kernel that's around. Um, we've shown a few, some other properties. One that's basically a safety property is timeliness. Um, this is a prerequisite that allows us to do hard real time on the kernel. What it gives us is um, actually proofs of safe upper bounds for, among others, interrupt latencies. In general, all kernel operations. So we know how long a, any kernel operation can take worst case and how long it can take worst case for an interrupt to be delivered to the interrupt to the device driver. And again, as, at least as far as protected mode systems is concerned, SCL4 is the only one that can give you these guarantees. Anyone else who claims to have a hard real-time capable operating system, they're basically just hand-waving. The typical way to do it is you just load up the system, hammer it with interrupt, apply a factor 10 safety factor and claim this is your safe upper bound. Of course it's not. No one actually knows what it is, except us. Right. Um, so one question is, okay, how much sacrifice did you make for this? In particular, how much form, performance did you lose for um, getting all this assurance? And it turns out the news is good here. I don't believe in trading performance for security. And um, SEO4 is in fact the world's fastest microkernel. 
So we outperform even our previous kernels, um, partially due to a more optimal design, um, but also because we can actually uh, afford to basically optimize the crap out of the system. Because if you change something, we run the proof through. If the proofs check out, then we know we're good. If not, they tell us where you have to, where you want to debug or where you need to debug or fi either fix up the proof or the um, the bug. So if you if you make a change, it can invalidate the proofs in two ways. Either you get into a configuration which is not covered by the proofs, in which case you have to add more proofs, or you introduce an actual bug, and of course in this case the proofs cannot work out. By the way, um, feel free to uh, interrupt me any time with questions if you have any. Yes, please. Uh, just, just uh, I, I'll repeat the question if necessary. This might sound like uh, I'm being patronized, but I'm, is there a proof for the proofs? Because you said if you, you make a change, there may be, there might be a proof that you're missing. So how do you know to start with that you have all the proofs? Yeah. Okay. This is actually a really good question. Any of this stuff would be utterly pointless if it was pen and paper proofs, right? The proofs are machine checked, and as a matter of fact, the proofs are massively bigger than the kernel. So the kernel is about nine thousand lines of code. The functional correctness proof alone is 180,000 lines of code. <laughs> so we have, <laughs> we have a factor of 200 um, blowout in um, proof versus code. So that, a proof of that size would never be correct, right, unless it's machine checked. So there is a, a proof assistant in which all the proofs are done, and it has a very small proof core that runs all the proofs. So the, the proofs are done more or less manually, either completely manually or directed by the programmer or the proofer, um, but then they get checked by the proof co checker core f to, for soundness in the mathematical logic. Yeah, this is yeah. Isabel Hall. So the question was what proof assistant we use, Isabel. Yeah. Um, are you going to show us what Sorry. the uh, uh, personal is? Sorry, we probably the personal is having the mic as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it may be easy if I repeat the question. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, will this talk show an example of some of the um, sorts of proofs and how that sort of thing works? Um, no, but I can um, take show some of that offline. I've, I've got some slides that show a lot of examples, but um, it, I mean, I'm not proofing anything myself. I, I'm a systems hacker, right? Uh, and I don't know any, uh, I, I'm not a former methods person. It takes a fair bit of expertise to do this sort of stuff. It's not for the, for the faint-hearted. <laughs> Yeah. And then over here. Sorry. Thanks. Um, the assembly that you write for the low level architectures, is that mathematically checked with the proofs? This is my caveat. There's a few things that are exclude, that excluded from the verification at the moment. Um, there's two assemblies is in two bits. There's some in the initialization code, and then there's some in the in the context switching code. And at the moment, none of the assembler code is verified formally. It's validated in the traditional sense. We look at it and um, we test, etc. Um, that that's not a principal limitation. Um, it's just that we we haven't really got around to fixing all that up yet, but um, it, it's a valid observation. And, uh, just to add to that question, is it radiation hardened? <laughs> <laughs> is it radiation hardened? Actually, I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> short answer: We're working on it, but um, yeah, if 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 I don't mention it explicitly, ask again. Yes, so the purpose of open sourcing it is for people to embrace it and extend it in terms of adding and porting into different architectures. Is there any architectural assumptions you've been making in this? Porting this from okay. ARM can, to Can I defer that system? question to later when okay. I talk about the uh, development process? Yeah. This one might also be deferred for later, I don't know, but I just want to know the. Where you've got the exclusions, the, the privileged state and caches, multi-core, and the, the timing channels, um, is, is that actually 
completely excluded from any of the actual checking, or is there some kind of guarantee around those three? So when I say privileged state and caches, that basically means we don't have a formalization of a memory model yet, so, which means at the moment we, we, can, cannot, we don't have a way of knowing when we have to flush caches for that, that just requires programming intuition. And actually, we have found bugs in the kernel exactly there. So that, that, that's really sort of an interesting and, and scaring observation. It shows basically anything that's not proven is going to have bugs. <laughs> and um, so there, there, there's still a chance that there's bugs lurking in the kernel in exactly those bits. And the, obviously, memory models are quite complex. Um, it's something we are working on. The, but you need a you need a formalization of how the memory model of, of you need a formal memory model of the hardware, um, and the other thing is the MMU is model at the high level, so not quite the ISA level. Um, so there there's some uh, some high level model of how memory of how virtual memory works, and um, we prove against that. Um, it's also ongoing work to really get that down to the basically level of describing MMU operation at um, register transfer level language sort of thing. Uh, Multicore, we have a high level concept proof if you like, um, which we know we can execute and will eventually. So we, we're basically working on, on this list and initially the list was about twice as large and about every year I can take one dot point off. <laughs> The, the initialization bit, we're not doing anything at the moment because it's just bloody boring, right? <laughs> we, we sort of, uh, it, it's pure engineering. Um, we, we had an proof of initialization of a high level model early on, which is not current anymore, but we know how to do it. But it's, it's basically someone who actually wants to deploy this, um, they can give us some money, we'll do it. it, it from the research point of view, it doesn't buy anything for us. Uh, timing channels. So note that I restrict this to timing channels. So our isolation proof in principle excludes storage channels. And that's also something that's really unique, right? This is the only OS kernel which you know is free of covert storage channels. Um, the general uh, belief in the community, in the security community is you can't completely get rid of timing channels. Um, but we have ongoing work which I'll touch on later on as well. And turns out the kernel design actually enables a lot of that. Okay, so let's go carry on. What is L4 not? L4, SEL4 is not an operating system. It's an operating system microkernel. And to get a complete operating system, you need additional stuff. And all the interesting things that make an operating system, in a way, is pushed out to user land. And that's common to all L4 uh, microkernels. So it's basically your problem, right? I have nothing to do with it. Uh, it's not, not quite true, right? In order to build stuff with it, you need at least some of these things. Turns out these days, by just running Linux in a virtual machine, you can actually get a lot of the traditional OS services. For example, you can have a file system, you just encrypt stuff by forehanding it to Linux, and then it can be safely uh, stored in a Linux file system. So a lot of the traditional OS services we don't necessarily need, depending on what kind of system you build. The point is that because all these things run as user-level processes, they're encapsulated by the strength of the isolation properties that are enforced by the microkernel. And that gives you a really strong kind of peace of mind. If one of these things blow up or misbehave, etc., the damage they can cause is limited. And we can actually analyze the system formally to um, establish the extent on the damage that can be caused, which is also really unique. Uh, obviously, isolation by itself is not good enough because that doesn't allow you to do anything. You need communication, and so we have high-performance uh, IPC channels, which are um, controlled in the sense that we have um, strict enforcement of who can communicate with whom and can make that subject to a system-wide security policy. So in that sense, we can control information flow in an SEL4-based system. Um, right. So 
what is ELF, what's different between SEL4 and other L4 microkernels um, besides the, all the, the verification story. The biggest difference is the way we do resource management. So from the OS design point of view, this is where um, SEL4 really broke new ground in the sense that all memory management gets exported to user level in a, in, in a very complete sense. The kernel, other than sort of when it boots up, has no memory allocator. It just allocates its static memory and that's it. Everything else needs to be supplied by user level. And this is really the core of some of the strong isolation guarantees you get. So the way it works sort of in a high level view is kernel boots up, it grabs its own data and um, uh, memory for its own data and text somewhere and then the rest is handed off to user level. So there's a protocol to start off initial ta an initial process which we can tend to call the global resource manager because it's in charge of everything, everything except the pure static kernel data. And then it's up to this thing to what to do with the system. And one thing it can do, for example, is partition the system. So it has all the free memory and got all rights to this and it can set up, say, two exclusive partitions and then let each of these partitions totally autonomously manage each other. And they can then allocate free memory, etc., create a, a address basis thread and all that stuff without ever referring back to the original global resource manager. That can, if you want a statically partitioned system, that could, for example, then just deallocate itself and get out of the picture. And uh, the partitions are strongly partitioned and they need, they then manage themselves. And because the kernel doesn't have a memory allocator, it means whenever you want to do an operation that requires the kernel to, to use memory, object descriptors, data tables, thread control blocks and all that stuff, you need to explicitly hand memory to the kernel for doing this. And this is what forces the isolation from user level back into the kernel. Because if those two resource managers, they um, allocate objects, they need to, from their own memory pool, supply kernel, um, the kernel with memory for backing the, for, for basically kernel met metadata. And because this comes from partition pools and user level, it's totally partitioning the kernel. And that's really what leveraged the information flow proofs we did, which guaranteed the isolation. Um, and you can carry it on, so sort of it works all recursively. So that this is sort of what, what's unique about SEL4 from the um, kernel model point of view. So can you build actual systems with it? Um, yes, this is what we're doing at the moment with um, our friends at, in the US, Rockwell Collins, Boeing, Galois and the University of Minnesota in a project that's funded by DARPA, the US Defense Department funding agency, where we are building a high assurance drone. Uh, well, actually two. One is the research vehicle, which is the thing we play with, where we pretty much build everything from scratch. Um, some may have heard of the Smackencopter, which is the um, flight control software that's being built by Galois. This is all tightly integrated into a high assurance system. And then there's the Boeing optionally manned helicopter. So this is a full-size helicopter that can fly with, with or without a pilot. And the technology gets transferred on there. So by probably mid this year, this thing will fly in SEL4. And what's under the hood, it's very high level view, that's the structure of the system. You see that there's two processor board, the control board, which is sort of the cerebellum, and the mission board, which is the main brain. Um, and they run all the software on that system. We could have run everything on a single processor on SEL4, but we specifically choose this distributed architecture because it is more reflective of the actual Boeing um, commercial helicopter. Um, they don't want me to put up the block diagram of their system, but um, trust me, this is a very fair, um, a very reasonable model of the um, actual Boeing system. So it has a on the one part, the board is a microcontroller, it's an ARM M4 um, that runs Ekronos, which is our verified Artos, one second, and all the low-level flight control runs on this. 
and then there is the separate um, ARM A15 processor board which runs SEL4 and sort of the high level command control operation as well as a lot of um, untrust this is of course where the SEL4 properties come in we can run an unverified Linux untrusted um, we can be sure it can't interfere with the rest of the system the project has a red team whose whole purpose in life is to try to break in there and our purpose is to keep them out um, we assume they will compromise Linux if surprisingly they didn't manage to do that then we will give them a root shell anyway so we make sure the enemy is on the platform and we keep the rest of it safe um, that project is two and a half years into a four and a half year period um, so it's got another two years to run and as I indicated there will be a first flight demo with the actual helicopter this July which is what we're really looking forward to. Peter. Uh, about a year ago I was looking at the block diagram for that and I th was sure I saw a version that had an ARM 11 there rather than the A15. Did it start on a V6 or is that me imagining things? <laughs> No, we never had an A11. No. The, the thing as it comes off the shelf has, um, it may even be an ARM 9 or something like that on there. Um, but we ripped all that out. So we, we replaced the, the electronics as well as the software. So it's always use, been using the ARM hardware virtualization as the basis? Yes. That, okay. Yeah. That's the, that, that's the reason why we went for an A15. We, we need the, the hardware virtualization extensions because um, power virtualizing Linux is a, um, a lot of engineering work and be very error prone and sort of takes away a lot of the assurance stories. Okay, so this is a really exciting project, of course, right? And um, we only need, only at the last PI meeting in last July, so two years into the project, the security expert at DARPA stated that this is already the world's highest assured UAV, and we're only at the beginning of everything. So, um, and it's actually scary the, how true that statement is. The red team had no problem breaking into the Boeing helicopter, and now this is supposedly military grade secure system, blah, blah. <laughs> Nikos? And not a directly technical. Hi, uh, Is DARPA funding you or Boeing, which contracts you? Uh, a, a business and security question. <laughs> So now the, the prime contractor for the project is Rockwell Collins and they are the integrator and we are subcontractors to Rockwell Collins, so is Boeing. So you are not bound by DARPA conditions directly? Uh, no, no, we are. I mean, the, 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 doesn't matter who spends the DARPA money, it's subject yeah. to their conditions. Well, I'm thinking about the ITAR so, kind of yeah, things. We, Initially, when this whole thing was set up, which was before SEL4 was open source and before we knew we could open source it, um, that was a very painful thing to negotiate ourselves through the lawyer, legal jungle of trying to make this all work. All that's gone away. They're actually very keen on open sourcing as much as possible. And now I think we, we will be able to open source everything that's running on the research vehicle. Um, the, basically our, the software we created but didn't own for historical reasons was the main stumbling block for open sourcing. All the stuff Galois and Rockwell Collins contribute, that's all being open sourced. And so yes, we, we, we shouldn't mention this because it's not um, official yet, but we're open sourcing Ekronos as well, end of this month. And so really everything will be open source. Which is of course cool because that, that really allows everyone to benefit from the innovation that's being done in this project. And there's really gonna, uh, a lot of really cool stuff coming out of there. For example, the, the work Galois does is on using high level domain specific languages to generate code. Um, that's not, some of it will actually be generated provably correct. And so that basically pushes the assurance story into user land and uh, that, that's very exciting. So it's, it's, it's an incredibly cool project in many ways, besides being able to fly on a helicopter. <laughs> okay, so this is sort of what the current state is. Um, what, what are we actually working on? So pretty quick overview there. Um, 
Some of that is just engineering. So we've got multi-core support running, very stable, very good performance, scalable to where we want it um, in the lab, and it's basically ready to be pushed out. It will happen as soon as we get our act together and um, getting it releasable, um, which should happen in the next few months. Um, full virtualization support for both ARM and x86 is running very well and is in a similar state, so it will be pushed out um, probably, yeah, I, I don't want to nail myself down too much, but definitely in the next few months. 64-bit um, support for now only for x86 is not quite as um, ready as the first two, but it's pretty close. Um, it's running very well and um, should also be pushed out in the next few months. And that sort of um, basically um, removes a lot of the usability barriers, I guess. Um, and so far we haven't got any ARM64 hardware we'll get, uh, unless you ordered some, right? You haven't got it yet. Um, it was a bit, so... Yeah, right. Um, as soon as we have ARM64 hardware, we'll be working on 64-bit support for ARM as well. So these are the engineering bits. And there's stuff that's more researchy. I mentioned timing channels before. So we, we're actually working on mechanisms in the kernel to partition system resources in a way that eliminates most timing channels. And um, we, we're making good progress on that. Uh, so that, that will be pushed out sometime this year. I, I, I can't be any more precise than that. Similar different kind of temple issues. Um, we're working on a revision of the API to make it more suitable for the most general class of real-time systems, so-called mixed criticality systems, where you have mixtures of hard real-time, soft real-time, or hard real-time of different criticality, where some deadline misses are disastrous and others can be tolerated occasionally, etc. Um, th that's very stable now. We're in the evaluation phase and um, it should hopefully come out sort of mid-yearish, mid I'm hoping, to push that one out as being mature enough. And um, then there was the question, uh, red hardened. Um, we're actually working on that. And the idea is to use a multi-core processor uh, in a DMA, so dual or triple modular redundancy with independent kernel images that check each other for consistency at kernel entry and exit. Um, that work is reasonably mature. We just submitted a paper on that. And um, again, this should come out sometime later this year, hopefully sort of again mid-year, we should be able to push that one out. And of course, that, that is an interesting um, development because it yes it allows you to get around the issues that well at the moment if we have very strong guarantees right but if the hardware under our bumps flips a single bit then all bets are off and um, with this support we can get the bets back on and so this is short-term research and then there's sort of um, a bit more long-term research uh, things we're working on and they're basically all around reducing the cost of assurance. So just to give you an idea, good. Um, at the moment our evaluation showed that we spend about $380, $280 or so per line of code on the functional correctness proof. Um, that was very cheap labor, partially, etc. And um, we spent a bit more for the rest of the system. But sort of the, the ballpark figure, 400 bucks per line of code for getting proof of code. This is design, implementation, verification, everything included, the whole life cycle cost, if you like. And that compares to $1,000 per line of code, which is a 10-year-old figure from Green Hills for building a high assurance system. So we're already very cost competitive in the high assurance end. And of course, we, out, we, we have a current that's as fast as get all the other so-called high assurance systems, which have no proofs. Um, their performance is very poor. And then the other um, data point is the pistachio kernel, which was done about 10 years before SEL4. Similar, it's a, a member of the L4 op microkernel family, done by a similar group with similar experience, so quite comparable. And they spend about 200 bucks on low assurance code, also high performance. So we're basically only a factor of two away in the cost of our provable correct code from 
classically engineered low assurance code. And we're basically working on closing this fact of two gap. And so if we can get our co overall cost down by fact of two, then we can produce verified code cheaper than anyone else does unverified code. And of course, that's going to revolutionize a fair bit. Um, and I think we'll pull that off in the next five years. And there's sort of what we're using is a um, combination of synthesis. So we're doing synthesis of device drivers, where you're given a formal specification of the hardware interface, a formal specification of the OS interface, and from that you synthesize the device driver. Works for simple drivers, doesn't really work for real world yet, um, but it's a promising approach. A, in a way, sort of a bit more. Um, traditional, but in other ways more ambitious, is similar to what the Galois people are doing, um, code and proof code generation. So specifying the logic, and we're trialing this on file systems at the moment, specifying the logic in a very high level language, which already gives you probably the fact of two productivity boosts already, and from that generating not only the C, but also a correctness proof for the C. And that eliminates then all testing. And this is going very well, and I hope to declare success in about three months' time on this one. And that, that's going to be very cool. And uh, the, set, the, the approach, if it works for file systems, it will work for network stacks and other systems code. So that, that, I think that's the, the coolest thing we do at the moment. And then you really want to get away from C, right? C is the right th vehicle for the kernel. Application stuff, including other systems code, should be written in something more suitable. Something which is type safe, memory safe, where you can then reason in the, log in the semantics of that language and do verification there where it's much cheaper. Um, and that requires, in order to, for this hold, to hold together, requires um, verified runtimes and compilers, etc. And we're working on that with people from the ANU and Purdue University. Again, quite exciting, but probably a bit, this is a few more years to go until this one becomes mature. So, what you hopefully interested in is sort of what, what's the ecosystem like? How does the development process work, etc.? So this is what you see when you go to the portal. If you go to sel4.systems and you get um, directed to a Git repository, this is what you see. There's two Git repositories, two branches in Git, uh, GitHub. Um, what we call the SEL4 stable, and stable means it's the verified kernel, it's the real thing, and you get all the proofs with it, but everything is open source. And then is what we call experimental, which some people think this is experimental code. It's not. It's, very, it's pretty solid code. We released it. Um, what it is is the difference between experimental and stable is experimental is not verified. Um, but it's basically, by getting in there, it's on the roadmap to be verified. There's no timeline associated with it, but we're committed to verify it. And we know we can verify it. That's the important thing. So it's, it's if you like, the staging repo for verification. So this is what you see, and then of course people have private branches. Beyond that, we don't have like an internal staging branch for feeding in there. It's everyone has their own, and then um, if we agree that um, we want to push it in the public version, then we do that by releasing it. And what this really means is pushing it in the public version is that we make a commitment that eventually we will, re we will verify it. And that means we have to be convinced that we actually can verify it. And this is why we don't really expect community contributions to the kernel itself, because it really requires this commitment to verification. And therefore, you need to really understand what you do with respect to verifying. Um, we won't stop people from submitting patches, um, in particular platform ports, etc. But remember, we're not going to put it in the public version unless we're convinced that we can verify it and we think we will eventually. Um, so, question is, how can you contribute? Really cool if people will building user-level stuff for that. So libraries is an obvious one. At the moment, the library support is pretty rudimentary. It's an incomplete C library. A little bit more than that, but not much. Platform ports. 
So we have a few platforms which we sort of support more or less. Some we support and others we sort of support. And um, it'd be cool if people port it to other platforms and continue contribute to that back. Device drivers, obviously, for any new operating system, big pain point. Eventually, we hope to solve that with synthesis, but that's still um, not ready yet. So, if people um, contributed to drivers, would be fine, cool. Similar network stacks and file systems. So we have LWIP sort of. Um, there, there's definitely more that would be really useful. Tools. We have a few, uh, particularly our component system. Um, there's definitely lots of work to be done, and then languages. So C++, we have core C++ support. That's actually just been pushed out yesterday. Um, it doesn't support the standard template library, um, but if you don't need that, then most programs should actually work, uh, at least Adrian claims. If not, fix it or tell us. Um, would be really great if people took that one and um, made it more complete. Uh, we are working with Galois on providing Haskell. That should get out in the not too far future. Um, no one, as I know, is working on Python. It would be really awesome if people built a Python port on SEL4. Okay, so why would you not use SEL4? Okay, one reason is it's a bit rudimentary, so you need to be a bit of a Spartan um, for doing it at the moment, so that's a fair point. Um, but it's the one you can help with, right? Everyone can help fixing that one. Um, other than that, okay, maybe you like insecure systems, right? <laughs> some people like sunny weather, some people like rain, some people like safe systems, some people like unsafe systems. Okay, if you want to shoot it. <laughs> Um, maybe you like the thrill of danger. Why am I saying that? So imagine you're building a security or safety critical system and you're starting now to design a new safety or security critical system. And it comes on the market in three years time and another three years later someone gets killed by a malfunction. I think there will be a lot of lawyers who try to, will try to rip your skin off because you built on a safety critical system on technology that wasn't state of the art. And at the moment, everything that's not SEL4 is not state of the art as far as security or safety is concerned. So this is something people should be aware of. There's lots of lawyers who like to rip people's skin off. Um, so it's, I, I, think, I think this is, this is a real serious point, right? If you build, some, if you build a nuclear power plant, it needs to be damn safe, and you should have the right technology for it. Um, sorry, I, I wrote, uh, I, I signed something that uh, everything I said had to be um, <laughs> para <Okay. laughs> no, uh, T rated, I believe. So. <laughs> um, and maybe you just want to use SEO phone, of course, that's the right answer. And um, that's all I've got for you. Thank you very much. Happy to take more questions. Peter here was first. Actually, two questions. One, you touched on at the beginning, the MMU model is, is sort of missing from the pr proof. Now, I'm aware that most of the memory management is out of the kernel, but what plans do you have for further proof on or modeling the MMU and the DMA? That's one half. And the other half was I noticed you one of the boards there you mentioned to port to was BeagleBone, which doesn't have the virtualization extensions. How do you see Cell 4 being used on, on systems without hardware virtualization? Okay, the first one, um, IO and uh, DMA. We, for, of course, DMA you can only have secure if you have either a trusted driver or an IO MMU. Uh, both are possible, right? On systems without an IO MMU, you need to trust at least the DMA controller driver. And so, yes, if, if we wanted a real strong assurance about that, we'd have to verify that one. Um, and otherwise, yeah, we use an IO MMU and we will verify the IO MMU 
code, which is just another memory management code, right? Um, and then that should be the end of that. The, the second one, um, of course, we've been running, when SEL4 was first verified, there were, was no hardware virtualization support on ARM, and so you can use the system, fine, um, for, but of course you can't run a virtualized Linux system because we're no longer supporting power virtualization. Um, but but it's it's obviously in many many most designs we're looking at there is some virtualized legacy or is lurking somewhere uh, just provi to provide legacy functionality or just networking functionality etc. Um, we're just starting to touch on that with the the legacy and the hardware virtualization support, um, which leads nicely to my question. You, in in the slides you were showing that. Um, inside the system of a, a very, you know, real world example is actually a Linux kernel. Is that sufficiently isolated that you would not actually worry running two of those side by side? If you were giving the red team their own whole kernel, would they be able to get to the next one? No, they won't. <laughs> Okay. This is fundamentally what our security proofs guarantee. They, of course, they don't guarantee that the system is secure, but they guarantee that you can set up a system that is provably secure in the sense of providing this kind of isolation, right? So um, it's, all, it's never impossible to build an insecure system on a secure kernel. But the secure kernel allows you to build secure systems if they're structured, co architected correctly. And now, um, isolation proofs are actually constructive in the sense that they allow you to check whether your system satisfies these requirements. And, and that's and we... sort of following to anyone who's actually thinking of putting Linux on there, is it actually possible to provide a lot of the missing pieces that you were illustrating were sort of still missing using the Linux kernel? Yeah, exactly. So I, I alluded to that already, right? So what you can use, encryption is a, a great thing, right? If you have a trusted crypto library, which hopefully, I mean, we're not crypto experts, we can verify that the code has been implemented correctly, but we can't check that the crypto makes sense. But if you have that, then you can use tunnel a lot of stuff through an untrusted Linux system, right? It, obviously, what it still can do is denial of service, but beyond that, it can't violate confidentiality or integrity of your data if you use your crypto correctly. Um, and that's been done before. Right? Our friends in Dresden have done a trustworthy file system based on an untrusted Linux file system with encryption about six years ago or something like that. Uh, and then, of course, we're using similar things for tunneling data through a, a network stack that's running in Linux, etc. And of course, in many designs, we have multiple Linuxes because we want to break down functionality further and rather have one big monolith, have just a, one Linux for basically one service. And um, if you have enough memory, then it's a reasonable way to um, build a more robust system. Yeah. So it seems to me that given that there have been exploits in um, virtualization systems, uh, that it might be a good idea to use this for like a bare metal virtualizer to run, say, right. provide so VPSs with rather than running Linux on uh, Linux. Ab absolutely, yes. Um, I mean, if you use Linux as a hypervisor, as the KVM does, then your hypervisor is a million lines of code and it's all untrustworthy, right? Yeah. Uh, and this is basically, that's the failure of the cubes model. And if you look at our list of suggested projects, cubes on SEL4 is one. And we actually have an undergrad student working on that one, but um, that would be, it would be nice if there was a bit of, um, a bit, bit, bit more critical mass behind that one. Would be really cool. Yeah, because as, as with the thing mentioned before, if you're running two side by side, would you trust it? There have been exploits in virtualization yep. systems which would allow you to do exactly yep. that. Absolutely. And it, it, it's obvious that there had to be, right? You have such a big trusted code base, um, no matter whether it's KVM or Zen or so, they all weigh in at at least a million lines of code. And of course, the scary bit is really the hardware because the question is how much can you really trust the hardware? Of course, everyone trusts the hardware on top of their massive code base. Um, at least we only trust the hardware and only otherwise code we can prove to be correct. But there's no guarantee. And if you ever looked at the narrator sheet of any modern processor, they're scary, right? Well, one, one word, microcode. 
Yeah. <laughs> Um, but um, that's not a problem we can solve, right? It's an orthogonal problem. Uh, we can only take the hardware we got. Uh, do you see that there'll be a time where you take a journey in the uh, full-size helicopter while the red team has access? <laughs> <laughs> I would, but they won't allow me. <laughs> How soon? Uh, and they, they, they were quite specific that they were not going to do hacking at, uh, attempts while in flight for, for simple safety reasons, etc. <laughs> we have time for maybe one more question. No? Okay, so thank you very much, Gunnar. We'd just like to present you with a small gift to say thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. And thanks for all you coming and asking questions. Much appreciated.